You know, the last few weeks, as we were in the third week of Advent, and, and the last few weeks we've been studying, what does that mean? And, and the Advent translated actually means coming, and it's, and it's the hope of what is to come and what will be. And we celebrate with confidence. We celebrate with confidence the first Advent, and we live in hope for the second Advent to come. The first Advent was the hope of the coming Messiah for the Jewish nation, for the world. But the second Advent is in hope of the second coming for the, when Christ comes back for his church. Now, if you go back in the first, the first week, we talked about the hope uh, uh, was in anticipation and that there was this, this settling of the an- anticipation for the people, that hope was in maybe this mighty military, not in um, a manger or a baby. Uh, hope was in justice and making things right, and, <clears throat> and hope was in the righteousness of, that Christ would bring. And, our second week of Advent, we talked about uh, this was the way of the Advent. And we talked about how the Torah translated out meant the way. And that the people, this was the way, the law, that it was going to become. And, and that John the Baptist was preparing the way. And then Jesus says, I am the way. And then his people in, in, in the book of Acts become known as the way. And so today, this third week of Advent, we're going to look at what it means uh, what, what is the hope is in the generosity? And what does that mean to us? And what does that mean for really for his people? If we're really going to be called his people, what does that mean to live in a state of generosity? You know, the gifts, we, this time of year, we talk about gift giving. We, we see that. We know that that's kind of the standard. Uh, we kind of get that basic beginning, you know, when the wise men, the magi, would show up uh, to, to uh, Bethlehem and they see Jesus. They brought the frankincense, the gold, and the myrrh. And we think about gifts, and this time of year, it's easy, and everybody runs their, <clears throat> their specials on gifts that they want to give. And, and you, can, you can go, and for $1.99, buy this, or for $9.99, you can buy this. And so for teachers and neighbors and folks that you want to give those gifts to. But, you know, when I start thinking about it, I think there's really some different options. There's, there's a surprise gift that you give. The, that maybe for your, a friend, you stop by and you pick up a Starbucks for him. Or maybe there's that excessive gift where he's just way over the top. It's totally unexpected. It's out of nowhere. It's that diamond necklace that a- Ashley's not getting this year, so you know. It's that excessive. But to see, that now that I've told you, it can't be a surprise, so maybe next year. Or maybe it's that need-based gift. It's, it's that gift that, that you just see that the family, maybe they, they're going through a hard time or they've lost a job recently, and, and you pick up an extra bag of groceries at the store. And, and so these different types of gifts. <clears throat> well, in 2005, there was, uh, we had an event in the United States that, uh, that really, I think, kind of changed the way we viewed things. In 2005, there was a hurricane that went through called Katrina. It was named as a deadly Category 5 hurricane. It came in late August. Basically, it hit the whole Gulf Coast from Florida to Texas. We were a part of this story. Uh, we, we got excited. We saw what was happening. The need was so overwhelming. Um, and our whole community, when I say community, not just our church, I mean Valparaiso and anything that was in the 219, <clears throat> we began collecting. We collected over two semi-loads full of supplies. We took money, we took, we put supplies, and, and we went down. We had a team the first trip. We ended up with about four teams that went over in the course of a year. But that first group that went immediately after the hurricane, it was 50 men or women, and, and, and we, we went and served. Uh, we drove through the night on a bus, and, and we got there and helped put roofs on and knock out drywall and handed out supplies. I mean, it was just, it was just one of those things that I, I can't explain to you um, but maybe if you go back and you can see some video of what took place. But we'll maybe talk a little bit more about Katrina at, 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 at the end. But what, what took place was just absolutely amazing. And so when we got home, one of the participants that was on the trip, uh, I, I guess watched the, the, you remember the Oprah show, the Oprah Winfrey show? And Oprah had advertised, we're looking for volunteers that had gone and served at Katrina, at Hurricane Katrina. And so this participant from VNC, she wrote in or called or whatever she did. And, and they said, you sent, yes, we had 50 people. We collected roughly $200,000 worth of supplies. And we sent my trucks. We hauled it down. And this is what we did. And they said, you know what? We want you to represent your church on the Oprah Winfrey Show. 
And, and, and so they come back and they said, we, you can send, I think it was eight people. You, you can pick eight people off the team. And so she came back. She's like, what do you want to do? And I said, I think you should find seven other people and go. I'm not going. Um, and nothing against Oprah. I just thought, I, I've never seen an Oprah show. I thought, this is crazy. I, there's football on Saturday, and I'd just soon... <laughs> I'm not going to go watch this show, and you had to stay for two. They were filming two shows, and I thought, well, that, that's wonderful. Go. And, 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 and uh, Pastor Tanner, um, you know, was my boss, and he said, no, I think it'd be great. You put the team together. You get to go. And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. And he goes, and, and, you know, the way bosses do, they said, no, no, you're, you're going. I went, okay, sounds good. And so I got to go. And uh, so we put together our, our eight people, and we went, and I was not terribly thrilled about it, but I, to be honest, I, w- I want to be transparent with you, that when I got there, and they started showing video clips and still pictures, and, and standing in line, everybody there had been a volunteer at some level, somewhere between Texas and Florida. So people in line start sharing stories. Where were you at? We were in Bila Battery, Alabama. I was in New Orleans. I was in Houston. I was in Florida. And, and people start sharing stories. And I thought, well, this is kind of neat. And so I stood in line, and we all talked, and everybody was sharing their stories. And it was pretty good. Well, we get into where they're filming, and, and, and I go to sit in my seat, and, and uh, they mixed us all up, and they would come for TV. They would move you around and do things. And, but luckily, one of... One of our former worship leaders, Joel Berberink, he, him and I got to sit together. Now, I, this is not anything towards Joel, but Joel was really familiar with the Oprah Winfrey show. I, I was not. I, I, I knew who Oprah was. I knew there was a show. Joel knew her address. And, and so he was, he was sitting next to me and explaining to me what was going on. And so the show begins, and they're talking about, you know, be happy, and everybody's smiling, and they're showing video clips, and wow, it was really cool. And a few minutes into the show, Oprah says this passionate speech about what has happened, thanking everybody in the crowd, and then she says, today is our favorite things episode. Now, you see, I didn't know what that meant. Now, everybody in the room, and now when I'm talking to going, bah! they were losing their minds. G- women, tears, they're hugging, they're in high five, and I'm sitting there. I, I mean, this is what I imagine a cult was like. And I'm looking at Joel for help. I'm like, what is going on? And he goes, she's giving everybody gifts, it's gonna be crazy. And then I gotta be honest, at that moment I went, oh, this is good. Ah! And I start screaming. I'm shaking Joel, I'm excited, we're hugging, I may have cried, I don't know. And for the next hour or so, for the next hour or so, she showered us with gifts, unbelievable gifts. It's just, I I mean, it was just hard to believe. I I just, I couldn't imagine it. For no reason, she wanted to honor Volunteers. Now, I have no idea how many people were in the room. I have no idea what it total cost. All I know is that she did it, and she even paid the taxes that we had to claim. And she did this. I mean, just unbelievable. People were going crazy. It was unreal. But it was a, a showering of generosity that, honestly, I'd never experienced before. And sitting there, he started thinking about it. And now years later, you get a chance to kind of process some things. You get to thinking about it a little more, and it was unreal. But generosity really isn't about the gift. And generosity really isn't about the amount that is given. It's about a condition of the heart. And so today, as we celebrate and we look at these things, and and that was an honoring thing, and I was so grateful and thankful for that. But as we look forward in what it means to live in a season of hope, in a season that I believe the church is being called to be generous. See, John the Baptist, as we've been following this story of John the Baptist, he's already proclaimed he was one that Isaiah had prophesied about. And then he begins basically his first message in Luke chapter 3, and he goes at the people. And when I mean that, I mean the church. Now, let's go. We're going to be in Luke chapter 3 today. If you got your Bibles, you can look there. Uh, It's on the live stream 
um, uh, the, um, excuse, the live event and the U version and the scripture will be up on the screen today. Luke chapter 3, verses 7. It says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him. And he starts off this way, which is, is really kind of harsh, don't you think? You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, that is not a warm, fuzzy Christmas message, right? That is John the Baptist literally taking off the gloves to slap us. And he's calling out the people. See, I mean, for some of us, you've been going to church your whole life, that your parents or grandparents, they brought you. And sometimes we begin to faith that our faith runs through a family tree. Now, there's some real beauty in that. That's really cool. It's, it's great. I mean, there's, there's greatness and heritage and legacy of handed down information. But see, the Jews in this time, they believe um, that they were automatically in, that they had a, a, a gateway straight to the kingdom of God because they were from Abraham. It's almost like because there was this covenant with Abraham that they were safe to do whatever they wanted, that they were untouchable, that their heritage became an end to their salvation. And they boasted about being children of Abraham and assumed that being part of his family tree gave them a pathway straight to the heart of God. And they could do whatever they wanted. And John makes it clear, and he's not subtle at all, that their assumption is inaccurate. That your heritage and your family tree do not disqualify you or qualify you. Your family is not really that big of a deal, or anyone for that matter. Nobody receives automatic entrance into the kingdom of God. It's, 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 when, it's when people are repentant and come forth. That's the very essence of John's message has been all along. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Not to rely on ancestry to save them. or, or It's just that he's calling them out. And he even goes as far to say, listen, it's not your get out of jail free card. If, if, if God needs more people, he can turn these rocks into it. If he needs more children from Abraham, these rocks will do. If he created Adam in the very beginning, it's not that hard to turn a rock into a human. He can do it. So something new is about to happen, and he's telling them, and he's prepping them that there is a new thing coming. And just like a fruit tree that doesn't bear fruit, you're going to be cut down if you are not in on it. Our family trees become meaningless if they're not bearing fruit. And if faith is not merely, uh, merely an identity, it's a way of living. And this way of living must bear fruit. Our creed and our deed must be in alignment. That what we say we are, who we say we are, have to actually live it out. And our creed and deed have to be in alignment. Luke chapter 3, verse 10, it says this. What should we do then? What should we do then? I mean, that, this would have been stunning news to this crowd. Because all they've ever heard of is there's a covenant God has made with Abraham and you're good. If you go all the way back to that, that covenant, all the way back in the very beginning, the covenant that was made was pretty one-sided. It was all in favor of Israel. And so there was a reason that there was a little arrogance with it. So this was new news. So then they say, what should we do? John answers, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? He says, don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. I mean, what should we do then? This is a beautiful question that the crowd's trying to figure out. I mean, you've just rattled our whole world. You've called us a brood of vipers, which is not nice. And now you've rattled our whole theology. And so it's the question that's being asked is, what should we do? What should we do? So in other words, if, if the things we have depended on for so long are not what will bring us to the kingdom of God, what will? If everything that we thought was going to lead us to the kingdom of God, what will? 
That's a great question. That's a question that needs to be asked. And it's so simple that what John tells them, basically tells them to share. You got two shirts? I'll give one away. I mean, the very thing that we tell every one of our children, all down to the other end of the building where our kids are, I promise you at some point today, somebody grabbed a toy out of somebody's hand, somebody started crying, and then there was a discussion about what it means to share. We've, we've been teaching sharing from the very beginning. It's one of the first principles probably most of us learned in our homes is what it means to share. We teach it to our kids. Don't be selfish. We teach don't take advantage of people. These are not complicated issues. I mean, in fact, it sounds very simplistic. I mean, John just rattled the whole core of their theology, and he comes back with, you should share. I mean, there had to be somebody in the crowd going, this guy has eaten some bad honey. He's lost his mind. He just rattled the whole theological basis for our existence, and his solution for us is to go share? Are you kidding? So they're not complicated issues, but they are difficult to live out. Because there's economic inequality existed at this time. And, you know, if you were a Roman citizen, then you were probably doing fairly well, and you lived a better life than everybody else. You were probably fairly comfortable. If you were not a Roman citizen, your life was probably a little bit of a struggle. I mean, there are stories where people would abandon their children on the side of the roads and hoping people would come and take them, and he just, even if they just made them slaves, that was better than dying in the ditch they were in. And so this inequality was very real. It was there. That these were the types of choices people had to make. There were stories of how the early church came along and rescued and became these orphanages that did not exist until the church showed up. So while some were living in luxury, there were others living in difficult poverty that needed slaves and servants to help them make their life as good as it needed to be. The Roman Empire was built on the backs of slaves and servants. So when ultimately, in order to have the wealth that existed, others had to go without. So for Rome to really excel and do what it wanted to be, it needed somebody to go without. So John the Baptist is redefining kingdom for them because the Roman Empire was the only kingdom everybody knew. The Roman Empire was vast, it was powerful, it was intricate, it was amazing, it had all these cool things, it was, it was the cosmopolitan of the world, it had everything you could wander. And so when they were thinking about kingdom, Roman Empire would have been what they were thinking about. And if it means to succeed, means to step on the necks of everybody else, then that's what you got to do. If to be a great success means I got to hold you down, then that's what I got to do. Because if I'm going to be great, if I'm really going to be a success, if I'm really going to be what I really feel like is my right to be, then I may have to hold you back. I mean, the Rome, so that's what it was doing. And so it didn't have this, this thought. And John the Baptist all of a sudden is going, the kingdom of God is saying, look out for your neighbor. Share. This would have been earth shattering. See, it isn't a stretch to see how difficult these thoughts of generosity can be. Because we also live in a world of economic disparity. I mean, there's all kinds of examples. We see it. Sharing may not have been as easy as we thought. See, in that Roman Empire, it would have been easy to covet luxury because that's what would have been in front of us. That's what would have been in front of the people. If you're really going to be, if you're really going to be the success, if you're really going to be at the top of the food chain, if you're really going to be the alpha dog, if you're really going to be the number one, if you're going to do whatever it takes, if you look at that luxury, then you got to think, that's where I want to be. And if that's where I want to be, then I'll do whatever it takes to get there. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes And he says, share a coat. You got two? Share one. So the, the tax collectors are saying, so what about, what about us? What, what does that mean for us? What, is, what does that mean for us? I mean, what do we do? And, and, and he didn't say, hey, he didn't chastise them about the job they had. He said, just don't take more than you got to. 
the, the soldier is going, hey, what about us? I mean, Roman soldiers, they could do whatever they wanted to do. A Roman soldier was free. If you were not a citizen of Rome, you were worthless. You were worthless. If they wanted your wife, they wanted your children, they wanted your belongings, they wanted your horse, they wanted your donkey, they wanted your goat, they wanted your house, it was theirs. And that's all they had to do. And all they had to say was, if that you had something they wanted, and they wanted it, then they'd say, well, this guy, just, he just talked bad about Caesar. Ooh, treason, get him out. That's all they had to do. It was that simple. There was no judge, there was no jury, it was done. And so Roman soldiers, when they're looking at John the Baptist going, Okay, this is crazy. I've never heard anything like this before. What, what about us? He just says, just do your job. Just do your job. Keep peace. Be content with what you made. Be content with what you made. And don't take anything else. I mean, if you think about this, you, you, you remember thinking, well, what, that's crazy. I, I mean, I, why wouldn't they just do their job? See, I mean, you think about what happens when authority and responsibility are out of whack, when, when the two aren't meshed up, and, and you have authority, ultimate authority, and no accountability, then you, and you've got a little bit of power, and there's things you want, and you want to move up the food chain, you want, to, you want to be known as that guy, then all of a sudden you can do whatever you want, and you can just keep climbing and keep climbing and keep climbing and keep climbing. And if there's no accountability, then what's to stop you? Maybe you've worked for people like that. Maybe, maybe you've lived with people like that. But you see how difficult it can be when there's nobody to hold you in check. When there's nobody to say, time out. It's not yours. Where's the share? See, there's a power and dynamic at play there. See, and for us today, it's easy to want more. It's easy to say that I'm never going to have enough, that, that I, I, I need to hoard this, I need to cape it, and we'll find shortcuts to wealth, and, and we'll use power to get ahead. We'll, we'll use whatever we have because we feel like what we see on social media, what we see in the news, what we see the really successful people that have unlimited resources to do what they want to do, and we begin to tell ourselves that's where we want to be. And so we become like the Roman Soldiers. We become like the tax collectors. Well, we have a little bit of a job, but we can keep moving the shell game over enough that I'll start to take it in. I'll start to win. And maybe someday I'll be ahead and I'll have all that I want. But as it turns out, those are not identifying markers of who Christ is calling us to be. In Luke chapter 3, verse, verse 15, it says this. It's to be, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wandering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is at the hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff and unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. See, Advent exposes our need for a kingdom that pushes us into the hope of generosity. Advent exposes the need that we have. So when we're here, if we're really going to be people of hope, I mean, if we're really going to be people of hope, it exposes this need for generosity. There's a great need in our community. See, the kingdom of God rewrites the rules and gives hope of a future where we can be united in love for our God and our neighbor. It is the way we treat and handle people. It's, it's the way we handle them when we drive. It's the way we handle them in the grocery store line. It's the way we handle them when they're sitting next to us in the movie theater. It's the way we handle them it, it, all these times. It's, it's about that. It's about how do we really do this. So when John's talking about sharing, that's a big deal because it's about how we treat people. It's how we treat people. That we're going to need more than material comforts. I mean, John was walking around eating locusts and wild honey. He was wearing some leather straps and camel hair. He was not concerned with fitting into the Roman culture. He was not concerned with any of those things. He was being his own man. 
that maybe we, uh, we would ultimately learn that more stuff isn't the end all. It doesn't take long for us to discover that the more overwhelmed we become with stuff and the need for more, the less happy we become with the stuff. The more that drives us, the more that pushes us, the less likely we are to want it anymore. It just becomes too overwhelming. It's just more stuff to manage. That people who are generous, that live a life of generosity, are happier. They're more compassionate. They may have less. They may not have the, the best cars. They may not have the best house. They may not have all the best stuff. But they tend to be happier people. They tend to be happier people. When we learn to live with open-handed generosity towards others, we learn to be more dependent on God. Because see, if our generosity is only out of our excess, out of the surplus, if our generosity is based on if I got overtime that week, if our generosity is based on if I was able to pick up a side job, therefore I get to go do this, then I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to pick a fight or throw rocks, that's probably at the end of the day, it's really not generosity. See, generosity comes out of our who we are. It's a heart issue. It's not a gift issue. It's not a money issue. It's a heart issue. Generosity at the end of the day comes here. It's who, it's how we're defined. It's who we become. I mean, if we, if we had to define the brand you know, last week we talked about the church became called the way. That, it was a movement. It was a revolt. It was, it was exciting. It, it was people taking the city walls, but not by violence, but by love. They were, they were bringing in and taking care of each other. But if you had to have a defining brand of the way, it would be generosity. The way the early church was known was for their generosity. They just, that's, that's how you picked them out of the crowd. I mean, we look at several points in Acts chapter 2, verse 45. It says, they were selling of possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And Acts 4, 35 says, Barnabas sold land to help anyone who had need. Paul begins an amazing Middle Eastern journey. He takes up collections, other believers, to go back for the church in Jerusalem for those that are being persecuted. See, the, the, the early church, the first church, when it began, it was defined by loving generosity. It was defined by loving generosity. Everybody knew who they were because of the way they treated their neighbor. Everybody knew who they were because if there was a need, they met it. They just did it. No judging, just did it. The way will be known by sharing. And there's hope this Advent because of generosity. You know, I, we talked a little bit about uh, Katrina. And, and I've been very fortunate I've, I've probably been on 50 or 60 mission trips, but Katrina and, and, and Bila Battery has a special, a special place in my heart. That time there was, was amazing. And, and, and there were, like, in Bila Battery, and we were just in one spot, in Bila Battery, Alabama. It was just completely devastated. I mean, homes had water five feet high marks all in it, and you, you got to go in and rip out drywall and Everything in the house is gone. You got to get rid of it. It can't stay. And then you got to go and you got to you got to bleach the studs and let it air out and get it ready. And the carpet's got to go. The hardwood floors have got to go. Your wedding pictures, they got to go. Your clothes, they got to go. Everything's got to go. You can't keep it. Once the water's been there, it's got to go. It's not restorable. And so these families would come in, and when I, when I say they would walk up to us, at the, and we, we'd set up camp at this little church, and we were helping there, and, 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 and uh, supplies would pour out into the street, and we had stacks and pallets of water and, and crisis care kits, and there was canned food, and there was clothing, there was medical supplies, and, and there was, we, we had brought, uh, because there was a fuel shortage, tankers couldn't get into the Gulf, and there was all kinds of issues, and we, we brought barrels of fuel. This church gathered, and we brought barrels of fuel. At the time, I thought, this is nuts. We're not even, we can't carry fuel, and, but we did, and it worked out. And, and we got there with our barrels of fuel, and, and, and we had all these things. And, and your air conditioning units had gone out, and it's, it's August in South Alabama. It's brutal, miserable. So the homes that were still standing had no air, and, and power was getting turned on and needed fans, and it, it, I mean, it just, every day the needs would change. 
And, and I remember that there was, there was a couple of days we had these pallets of water and we would hand out a, you know, a, a six pack of bottled water or a, or a case of water to a family and, and, and they would drive off and, and the more families would keep arriving and, and we would hand out water and, and we, we were starting to get concerned because the, we were running out. I mean, literally, there was no more water. And, and, and every time that we became short on something, another van would pull up, another truck would pull up and hey, I'm from Battle Creek, Michigan. Hey, I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. And they would pull up and they would drop off more supplies. Every time that we became short, a supply train showed up. And I, I mean, it was just, and we would say, yeah, I mean, we, you, would, you would sit and just be overwhelmed by what was taking place. And, and we would go out and do the demolition, we'd do all this, but I, I got stuck one, one day on the pumping gas, and we brought a hand pump, and, and, and people would come in. They couldn't, didn't have fuel for their vehicles. And, and this, this mom, this single mom had come up, and, and when they would walk up, sometimes they just looked like complete zombies. They, they were just done. They, I mean, they lost everything, everything. Their jobs were gone. Their homes were gone. Uh, some of them didn't know where their families were. I mean, it was brutal. And she said, I'm out of gas. And, and we had gas cans, and we would, we would pump two, three, four gallons of gas in. I mean, we were limited. And I gave her the gas can. I helped take it to her truck, and we, we filled her truck up and, or, you know, put that amount of fuel in. And, you, you know, sometimes when we get busy doing compassion, it's about the job, right? I mean, you, you, you're like, okay, i got to get to the next person. And it's a mash unit, and we got to go. And so I gave her one of the old pats on the back, and, and, and let it go, and I went next because, you know, we're doers, and I got to go. And 15, 20 minutes went by, and, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye the truck was still here. Not uncommon because you would tend to hang around, and, and where else were you going to go? What else were you going to do? Didn't think much about it. Half hour went by, and I turned around, and there she was. And she said, can I just have a hug? And I'm like, oh, you big loser. Why didn't you hug her earlier? And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. And I, I gave her a hug, and she said thanks. And helped her get to her truck, and she drove off. So I went back. I looked in my journal, because I, I knew I was wanting to tell you guys about this. So I, I went back. I looked in the journal I had from that, that trip. And two days later, from that moment, a little boy showed up, six, seven years old, and he's with his grandmother. And they're a little celebratory because power had just been restored at their house. It's now been two and a half weeks since the hurricane, but they just got power. And that meant that was a pretty good day. And this little boy, he, he walks up, and he is, he's, he's kind of got all smiles. And, and so what do we do when kids are happy? You know, we give them sugar because let's, let's, you know, let's lather them up. And so I went and got some fruit snacks and Starburst. I'm shoving stuff in the kids' pockets, and I'm doing everything I can. And he is now like over the top happy. And he is beaming. And he is excited. And, and, and I, I did not write down the young man's name. I have no idea. I have no idea what his name is. And I said, buddy, what, what's, what's going on? And he said, he said, my grandma's got power. She said, my mom has gas for our truck. We got a fan and I got fruit snacks. <laughs> and he jumped up in me, and I just sat and wept. I was done. That was it. I had to go walk down the street, come back. Because the church's brand is generosity. The church's brand is generosity. And if we're not going to be the church, we might as well not meet. Because the early church was known because of what they did. When they saw a child in the ditch, they took it home. When they saw a neighbor that had need, they sold what they had to do. They did what they had to do to take care of the people. Because their brand was generosity. And sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in the job, we forget to be the church. And generosity doesn't mean the fan, the gas, uh, the power getting shut on, or even the fruit snacks. Sometimes the generosity means 
I should have given that woman a hug. So today, our hope is in the generosity that you and I will be the church. That this Christmas season, it's not about the trees, it's not about the gifts, it's not about the parties, it's not about the celebrations. It's about the people that are walking around looking like zombies because their life, the pin and the hand grenade's gone off. And dadgummit, they need a hug. And they need the church. Nobody else is going to give them hope like the message that you have received. Nowhere else in this community will they get it but through you.